Yes, I might emphasize that. Uh, do get on our email list if you would. It costs us nothing to, to put you on there and to send email out. And if you uh, don't have email or if you're so old you don't want to start having email, we have a snail mail list too. So put your address on there, we'll send you a snail mail. We send out, we send out, we print and send out 4,000 copies of that newsletter a month. And uh, some churches get bundles, some individuals get one, but we have a lot of, a lot of good accompanying literature that goes with it. And uh, we're an organization that uh, facilitates churches, small churches, big churches, local churches out there across America. We haven't gone to work in Africa yet. We haven't gone to work in, in Canada or in Mexico, but we facilitate churches in the United States of America from coast to coast and uh, have connections and networking everywhere. I think I've only been to California once, but have helped uh, three or four churches there. In my tenure, we've helped churches in New Jersey and I've never been to New Jersey. So uh, we have some good connections. And uh, we help facilitate churches when they're in trouble. We help facilitate churches when they have a divided leadership, divided people. Uh, we help churches uh, with their constitutions, with finding pastors. And I have a video running, a little video loop out there of churches where we either place pastors, ordain pastors, install pastors, all the, that kind of thing. That's some of the work that we do. So I'm just emphasizing that today. So uh, grab, we just have a limited uh, supply of literature out there, but Dolores has a few items. Come and see her after the service and uh, get your name on that sign up list if you're not already there. All right, that's a commercial. <laughs> Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 46. There was a lady driving in Chicago, and she was driving over the 25 mile an hour limit. It's almost citywide. And uh, she was stopped by a Chicago policeman. And he walked up to her and asked her if he could see the vehicle registration and her license. The lady was 90 years old. And uh, the officer looked at her driver's license, and he knew right away she has a concealed carry. And he said, ma'am, you have a concealed carry. Are you carrying any, any firearms? And she said, there's a 25 caliber Beretta in my purse. He says, oh, okay. And she says, and there's a, there's a 45 semi-automatic um, in the glove compartment. He says, oh, okay. And she says, he said, and there's a 12-gauge shotgun in my trunk. He says, lady? You're, you're up in years. What is it you're so afraid of? And she said, not a doggone thing. <laughs> There's fears today. And I uh, want to talk about that a little bit, some of our concerns and fears. And, uh, <coughs> There's fear of COVID. And uh, almost every church we go to, we see people that are masked and some people driving their car masked. The sharply rising costs of living and skyrocket of inflation. Um, bank accounts, our bank uh, changed hands three times in the last five years. Uh, retirement accounts, falling stock market, concerns there. Uh, perhaps declining health. I often say, after 70 years old, stuff happens. You can't help it. You know, you get some surprises, not all of them the good. Uh, then there's being afraid of death you know some people are afraid to die some people should be afraid to die because they don't know Christ as their personal Savior but if you do know him you may be afraid because you never went that way before but the psalmist said even though I pass through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for thou art with me God is with us uh, perhaps it's climate change and uh, that's a good excuse for passing New spending bills just attach climate change, climate, a uh, green, little green to it, and it'll pass. Uh, climatologists predict that we don't have more than five to ten years to correct all this mess, but they've been predicting this since I've been in high school. 
I've been hearing it all my life. We don't have more than five or ten years. And here I am, 75 years old, and they're still saying it. Um, anyway, new nuclear facilities, weapons being developed around the world. Uh, we can sit here and bite our fingernails over that. We might fear people, especially if you're in my neighborhood, fear people that'll break into our house and do us harm. Uh, some people can't sleep at night because they're afraid of what might happen at nighttime. Shootings in the streets, bullets going through church windows. We've had two churches that have been recipients of bullets in, in Chicagoland, one in Chicago and one in Summit, Illinois. And uh, that's, but you know, being in church is the safest place to be on the planet. You know, I mean, we're where God wants us to be, right? Now, I was born in the city of Chicago, on the south side, Hyde Park. It's near where the Museum of Science and Industry is. And I've lived in Chicagoland most of my life. It, it is a tough place to live. A big city can be scary at times. It's especially scary if you have to travel that way and you get on that 294 and you get caught in a, a traffic jam. Usually people get on there about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and they, they ask us, how can you live like this? Well, we don't travel at 4 o'clock. <laughs> we live there. We know, we know better, not unless we have to. We were traveling one time at, near the state line in Indiana and uh, traveling there, uh, coming from Indiana into Illinois. Uh, it was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, pouring down rain, and uh, we're traveling in the left lane, but not going anywhere fast, stop and go, stop and go. Uh, just about at the state line, the two cars whizzed past us in the lane you're not supposed to use on the shoulder of the left side. And they were shooting at each other. Bang, 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 bang. My wife woke up out of her sleep, you know, to the bang in there. And a little bit further down, maybe, you know, half a mile down, we saw that one car that was in front st stop in that lane and uh, the driver was slumped over the wheel. And uh, I'm not stopping in the rain, and the police were on their way. I could hear sirens, but this is in rush hour traffic at five o'clock in the afternoon. And you don't have those problems in Delaware. <laughs> but uh, anyway, as many as 50 local shootings on a hot summer weekend make Chicago land less than a favorable place to live for many folks. People are moving out of the city. Businesses are moving out of the city, churches are moving out of the inner city, but if God has called us to ministry in northern Illinois, uh, he can protect us and keep us going, amen? amen? Most of us know this, but we still are concerned, let's say, at times. In the present times of trouble, and this is my, this is my big idea, God is our refuge. And there are three things that this means, and we're going to be referring to Psalm 46. Psalm 46, to the chief musician, a psalm of the songs of Korah, a song for Alamo. That's inspired, by the way, the little title. It's found in the Masoretic text and in the original text. And the psalm, the psalm goes like this. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not what? Fear. fear. We will not fear. Why? Because God's our help. Do you know there is an Almighty? Do you know there is a God who is the supreme ruler of the universe? Did you know that he's in charge? Not me. Not Pastor Dave. I'm Pastor Dave. Not me. Not my wife, even. She's in charge of a lot of things in the office. But no, uh, it's Almighty God. And, and uh, you know, he has to say so. He has to say so. And by the way, he's been the one protecting Israel for many years, and, and he will continue to. And uh, Israel kind of let their guard down. The people weren't armed. They thought that the government would protect them. Does that sound familiar? Okay, let's move on. We will not fear, number one, we will not fear as those who do not know the Lord. Do you know that you know my Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Amen. That's my Jesus. Amen. Do you know him? 
He came down to this planet, visited this planet out of time because he's timeless, stepped into time, born of a virgin, lived among men for 33 years, was crucified, died on a cross, hollering, forgive them, Father, for they know now what they do. He lived forgiving and he died forgiving. And he said, whosoever will may come. And he said, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. And whosoever can be anybody. And I'm so glad he included all of us. Amen. I'm too poor to afford it if, if there was a price on it. And God's too rich to accept our meager means. He made it available to anyone and said, whoever will may come. <laughs> If you know that you know Jesus as your personal Savior, we don't fear as pagans that don't know him. You know why? We read the last two chapters of the Bible. God wins. The devil loses. Enough said. You know, it, it comes out right in the end. It really does. And we will see his face and enjoy his presence for eternity. God is our refuge and our strength in this present world, evil that it may be. And it is an evil place. Very present help in trouble. Are you in trouble? Call upon the name of the Lord. My. I went to a union retirees meeting just the other day, and the, the uh, fellow that's the president of this group, he's had a heart transplant about nine years ago, and he got into some physical problems, and they did an angiogram on him because they, they thought that perhaps there was some kind of blockage on his heart, and uh, he knows the Lord. When they went in and they did this, uh, this procedure with him, they found out there was no blockage. And he says, I'm a little miffed by the doctors. They thought there was a blockage. They had me concerned and worried. And, and I thought that uh, they were going to encounter something and have to do some other procedure. And I don't want a procedure done on me. I came in through my groin and I could have bled to death and all this. I said, Dan, as either, either the experts were wrong or God had a moment here. And God heard you cry. I said, do you know he hears all of our prayers and, and, and many times says yes and answers them. And I said, they'll never give him credit, but you and me can, you know, and isn't it so? God is our refuge and our strength in this present world. Now, uh, verse two, uh, therefore we will not fear even though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Uh, no matter what happens on this planet, no matter what volcano explodes next, no matter what uh, tsunami develops next, God is in charge. Amen? Amen? If you believe in a worldwide flood, you know that the creation of the earth, the recreation and restoration of the earth afterward is just as important. And God brought the mountains up out of the water and, and put dry land back where it's supposed to be or where he wanted it. I think it's different than it was uh, in his original creation. But that's just as much of a miracle as the worldwide flood. Though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, you don't say, say, well, that's, that, that's let the band jam, you know, that sort of thing. A little pause there. That's what that's for. When you see that in the Psalms, that's let the band play on, you know, sort of a thing. Anyway, the waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Though the earth shakes, the mountains are carried away, the waters roar, the mountains shake. Though our lives are upset, we don't go where we want to go. Did you find the pictures of my car yet? Uh, there it is, okay, stop there. Stop there. Dolores and I travel a lot, and I, I know there are people praying for us. If we're sending out 4,000 pieces of literature and have hundreds of people on our email list, there's a lot of people praying for us at any, any given moment. We've been, we've been traveling through three tornadoes, not one or two, but three with our car. The last one we were traveling in, we were in Indiana near Wanata in LaPorte County. The sign said, you are now entering LaPorte County. We had a local station on that says, tornado has touched down in LaPorte County. Before I knew it, I hit a wall of darkness. And we're traveling at, uh, you know, like two, two or three o'clock in the afternoon. 
I hit a wall of darkness. And Dolores said to me, do you think we ought to pull off to the side of the road? And I said, okay, I'll try to. And I turned my wheel and the wheel would not turn. I was driving uh, her 2003 element. We still drive that thing. I just fixed the brakes the other day. But uh, I tried turning off, the wheel did not turn. The wheels were not touching the ground. So the manual, we talked to each other, what? The manual transmission. Manual transmission, I killed the engine because I hit the brakes, you know, right? And the engine died and I had to start it two or three times. We were talking to each other and I says, I can't control it. The car never left its lane. It continued at about 45 or 50 miles an hour. I could see the taillights in the distance of a truck in front of me. He was having probably a similar experience. And uh, we weren't touching the ground, but never left our lane. And this went on for about two or three minutes. You know what? It was a God moment. Now, driving our 2017, 2017 escape. Uh, we were near O'Hare, dropping a friend off at, one of my board members off at the O'Hare Airport. <coughs> and traveling away from O'Hare Airport, I was T-boned by a guy that was still accelerating when he hit me in an intersection. And uh, Dolores said, we're going to be hit. And we were hit. And he hit right behind me, right where the, uh, uh, I guess the bar is between the front, front door and the back door. And uh, she said, we're turning over we turned over on our side. And I'm wondering, how do I get out of a car turned over on its side? We had our seat belts on, and 90% uh, of the time she wasn't wearing a belt, but she was that day. Oh, we had friends in the car, we had to set a good example. <laughs> but I thank God she was wearing her seat belt. But we turned over on the side, and then she says, we're turning over again. We turned over on our roof, the car spun 180 degrees and finally stopped. And these are the pictures of the car. You can continue there. Uh, the next one. You see, where, you see where the side mirror that was on the side of the car is? It's in Dolores' spot. That's, that's the shape of the car. That turned. We found ourselves in an upside down car Within three minutes, we both were able to crawl out with a little help from motorists. They, they, well, we were stopping everybody in the intersection anyway, so they came over and pried the doors open, and we uh, climbed out and walked away from that car. Praise the Lord. The ambulance came later. We, we were way ahead of the ambulance or the police. Uh, the police said they wished every rollover would end like that. But uh, they don't. We were talking to each other while we're rolling over it. In time and space, it slowed down. And I know that it didn't. I know when a car is hit and it's turning over, it's boom, boom. But it slowed down. We were in another dimension. We were in God's dimension. And God will protect us. And if he doesn't and if he can't, nobody else can. You get it? Yeah. Oh, my. Let's get that into our spirit and really don't fear as others who don't know the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. The Apostle Paul said from a prison cell in Philippians uh, 1, uh, 21, I'm in a strait between the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. And he also said for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. Why? Because he's within the Lord's will, the Lord had Paul in the palm of his hands at that time, even though he was in prison. Uh, you know, better to know the Lord than others who do not know the Lord. How do others who do not know the Lord get through these tough, tough times? If, if this world is all the hope we have, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the government all we have here, we're in big trouble. We really are. You know, but we're not in big trouble because we know the one who is going to be the ruler of the kingdom and the ruler of eternity. And to be absent from the body is to be in an eternal state with the Lord immediately. Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives and know after this flesh is gone, worms destroy this flesh, and 
It is no more. I know that face to face I will see God. I'll see him and not another. And Job had that assurance. St. John the Apostle in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, uh, Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, you know, 300 times it talks about Christ appearing. He's coming back. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. amen. Can I get a big amen to that? Amen. When he comes back, we're going to see him like he is. People say, well, we see God? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because you're going to be like him. You're going to be in his image. And the image that he had in mind when he was putting the hands on Adam and already deciding where the nails were going, um, when he was putting the hands and the feet on Adam and breathing the breath of lives into him, the image that he had in mind was that this, this human will rule someday on this planet. It's going to be fulfilled in God's time. And I don't know how but I know God can do it, right? right? And so we trust in him. We don't fear as others who do not know the Lord. Number two, number two, we have a certain future in the presence of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord. I like the lyrics to Eric Clapton's song, In the Presence of the Lord. Uh, I don't think Eric Clapton knew what he was doing when he wrote it because he was high on heroin. But... Uh, in the presence of the Lord, we have a certain future. A certain future. The psalmist goes on. There's a river. There's a river whose stream shall make glad that city of God. A holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. And God is in the midst of her. And she shall not be moved. You get it? God is in the midst of something and won't be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raised, the ra raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. There's a river. There's a river, the streams lead, lead, lead from the city of God. And I don't care whether you're in the Old Testament, predicting the millennial reign of Christ on earth. You get into some of those latter chapters in Ezekiel you'll find there's a river that proceeds from the throne, from that holy city that God, not, not the Jerusalem of today, but the holy city that God puts together and the throne that he has there is a river that flows from it and the Dead Sea will not be dead any longer. That river goes down and waters the Dead Sea. There's fish in it and lots of water. The way they describe it, it comes up to the ankles and the knees and a little further out, up to the waist and a little further out is water deep enough to swim in with all kinds of fish for those fishermen like me that like to fish. But uh, there'll be a river. And when we get into Exodus 17, 6, uh, they had no water in the desert. They cried out to Moses, what are we going to do? You took us out of Egypt. We're dying of thirst out here. Blah, blah, blah. And uh, Moses says, or God says to Moses, go and smite the rock. Hit the rock with your staff. Moses goes and hits the rock, and water came out. Oh, it wasn't like a little spigot. No, it was like it was like the Des Plaines River, I think. You know, really huge, big amount of water because you had to water livestock and two million people out there in the desert. Lots of water when Moses struck the rock. Ezekiel 47 is where you find the story of the water that proceeds from the throne. Psalm 1 3, Psalm 1 3, the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a stream, of, uh, like a tree planted between the streams of water in the fork of the river, where there's plenty of nourishment and plenty of water. That's what you'll be like when you follow the Lord. John 4, 13 through 14, Jesus tells a very unsatisfied woman, he says, if you drink of the water of this well, you're going to thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I give you, it'll spring up into everlasting life. You'll never thirst again. She says, sir, give me that water. <laughs> she didn't want to come back to the well every day. That's what she was thinking of. And Jesus said, I give living water. 
John 7, 37, 38, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink out of his innermost beings will flow rivers of water, rivers of water. And then, of course, there's Revelation 22. Now listen to this. I'm going to read it. 22, verses 1 through 4. <coughs> he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit. Every month the leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations, and there shall be no more curse. Isn't that wonderful? The throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. There it is and his name shall be on their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, for they need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light. He's the creator of light anyway. And they shall reign forever and ever. Isn't that nice? Amen. That's how it ends. It ends with a river of life. Isn't that something? The rich man in Luke chapter 16 didn't fare so well. He didn't believe in the Lord. He went to hell. And he cried out from hell, and he said, from hellfire, he says, I'm tormented in these flames. Please, Abraham, would you send Lazarus with one drop of water? There's no water there. No water. There's abundance of water with the Lord. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. There's a tabernacle of the Most High, holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst. And she shall not be moved. She shall not be moved. The same God will help us today. You know what? He's timeless. And he can help us today. The psalmist realizes the presence of the Lord. David said, there's but a step between me and death. That's what he said. One of these days, Saul's going to catch me, and there's just a step between me and death. But God was in that step, wasn't he? And God preserved him. The heathen raged, kingdoms raged, kingdoms were moved. We've seen kingdoms raging this last week, amen? amen? And kingdoms moving this last week. When God utters his voice, the earth melts, it really does. And uh, God speaks, and it's the end. And he spoke it all into existence, you know, in six short days, didn't he? When he speaks, it's the end. And uh, we need to realize that. We go on. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. That's the way it's translated in, in English. And, and the same word is used as in verse 1. God is our refuge and our strength. But in verse 1, it means God is our shelter. When we come to this verse, it's a different Hebrew word. And it doesn't mean shelter. It means a high fort tower. God is a high fort tower that can't be breached. He's our high fort tower. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is really up there and well protected. He's capable of destroying even the greatest of armies. Look, verse 8. Come behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He's the only one that can bring peace. And I mean, we will pray for peace for Jerusalem and for Israel, even in the present age. And their favorite phrase, I mean, if you enter a room, they say shalom, that's peace. You leave a room, they say shalom. You know, it's a hello and goodbye. Uh, it's shalom, but they haven't had peace. But when God's in charge, it'll be it. Makes desolations in the earth, makes wars to cease the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, he cuts the spear in two, he burns the chariot in the fire. Uh, one day they'll beat their plows, their, their swords into uh, plows and their spears into uh, what is it? Uh, plow, plowshares and pitchforks or whatever. But anyway, uh, they'll be farmers instead of warriors because God will be in, in charge. He's capable of destroying the greatest of armies. Why? Because he's a high fort tower. Selah. Let the band play on. And uh, then we come to verse 10. 
So we have a certain future in the presence of the Lord. We don't fear as others don't know the Lord. We have a certain future uh, in the presence of the Lord. We are commanded to be still and know that he is God. Be still and know that he is God. Look at verse 10. Be still means hush, <coughs> hush. Know that he's God. He's God. God said to Moses, Israelites were complaining. They had crossed the Red Sea on dry ground in the middle of the night. Pharaoh and his uh, army of chariots start crossing the Red Sea. I mean, these people can do it. We can do it too. There's at least a mile swath there, water standing on edge. I think Cecil B. the Mill did a nice job of it, but it was more dramatic than that in real life. But as they're crossing, the people are complaining, they're coming after us, we'll all be killed, what are we going to do? And God says to Moses, stand still and watch the salvation of the Lord. Take one last look at your enemies down there. It's the last time you're going to see them. And God, you know, took the lug nuts off of their chariots, they lost their <laughs> wheels, and of course, 300 feet of water caved in on them and drowned them all. But God says, take one last look and stand still. Watch the salvation of the Lord. And God stepped in. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our high board tower. Once again, that phrase in Hebrew, in Hebrew, you know, in the Hebrew language, he's a high board tower, the highest of towers. He has the most powerful army in the universe. You can't slay his army. You know that when Satan is bound, he, he's bound and cast in a bottomless pit. Amen. Uh, some people say he's number two. No, he's not. He's bound by an ordinary angel. It's not even an archangel that God's command. Throws a chain on him, throws him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. He lets him out for a little season, you know, and Satan goes back to his dirty work. But uh, he's bound for a thousand years, and he's bound by an ordinary angel. He's not in charge, and it doesn't talk uh, about a long battleground uh, feud between God and Satan in the end. When God, God says enough, it's enough. And uh, he's cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Okay, Selah at the end. Let the band play on again. What does this mean? Okay, a little application. We do not know the future on this earth. Does anybody here know? No. We've read the last chapters, we know how it's going to end. We must know and trust the one who said, let not your heart be troubled. Who said that? Jesus, right? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. John 14, 1. Trust in him. Call upon him. Lord, come into my life. Be my savior. Trust in him. Uh, he will never leave you, no, nor never forsake you. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. That's what Hebrews chapter 12, verse uh, 5 and 6 say. He will never leave us, no, nor never forsake us. It's triple negative there. Can't. Can't get out of his reach. There's a triple negative in uh, John chapter 10, verse 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice, Jesus said. I, I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No, nor neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. There's a triple negative there, too. You can't get away from those triple negatives. God says, no, it can't happen. Can't get out of my hand, and I will never leave you. No, nor never forsake you. So yeah, uh, put your trust in the one that will never leave you or forsake you. Friends may come and go, but our Lord the Christ, if you're one of his sheep, you can't get out of his hand. All right, number two. Be assured that our God is absolutely in control. If this world is looking like it's got, gone out of control, it's because God has, as Romans chapter 1 said, given them over to their own lust and desires, and, and their own way of running it. Let them run it. Let them run it into the ground, God says. They're doing it without any credit to God. So be assured, though, that God is absolutely in control in a world that has lost control. 
Isaiah 40, 21 and 22. In the old King James, it says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he, he sits upon the earth. Uh, the the, the spear, sphere of the earth is what it means in Hebrew. In Hebrew, back in Isaiah, 700 years before Christ, Isaiah knew that the earth was spherical, and he says so. And God sits there in control of it. And uh, the inhabitants thereof are like grasshoppers. Have you been afraid of a grasshopper? I've thrown them out of my house a couple times. This year I battled the crickets in the garage. But uh, grasshoppers, man, I threw my tennis shoe at one, squashed them, threw them out of the house. Uh, uh, the inhabitants are like grasshoppers. All these people that think they can, <laughs> they're little gods or demigods or something, they're not. Uh, not, in, not, not when you, you're talking about the supreme ruler of the universe. And then verse 28 in the same chapter, Hast thou not heard, hast thou not understood, the Lord God, the creator? Um, there is no searching of his understanding. He didn't need a refresher course. Amen? Amen. God knows everything. He knows what he's about. And it may look like it's out of control, but it's out of control because human beings are running it, you know, or they think they are anyway, and making a real mess of it. But when God steps in, look out, and the government will be right, and the people will get along, and uh, we built, will beat our swords in the plowshares and our spears in the pruning hooks. I got it right that time. All right, number three. We, we who have trusted Jesus to be our personal Savior, we have, according to Peter, 1 Peter 1, 4, we have an, in, an inheritance. You ever been left an inheritance? We have an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and one that fades not away, reserved in heaven for each of us. And if nobody ever left you an inheritance on this earth, you got, a, you got one that counts for eternity, <coughs> reserved in heaven for you. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Good promise. That's a living hope, Peter says. Um, number four, we need to always remind ourselves that our citizenship is not of this world, but it's, of, it's of in heaven. Uh, Philippians 3.20 says our citizenship. Paul's writing from a prisoner cell, you know, once again. So our citizenship is not of this world, but it's of heaven. From whence also we look for our Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ will one day change these bodies. Boy, I need a change. I really do. Change these bodies. They'll be fashioned like unto his glorious body. By the working where all he's able even to subdue all things to himself. One day there'll be a change. And uh, we'll be with him for eternity. The citizenship is not here. It's not. I, I live near Chicago, but, you know, it's... That's an earthly thing. We have a heavenly home. And we need to be assured, also the world is passing away. God's going to burn it up completely. 2 Peter 3, 9 through 13, says the elements will melt with a fervent heat, and the earth and the works thereof will be burned up, and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Seeing how there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, what manner of people ought we to be looking for? That newness that God has for us. 1 John 2, 17 starts out, love not the world, nor the things that are in the world, all that's in the world, lust of the eyes, lust of the, lust of the eyes, pride of life, I know, lust, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It's not of the Father, but it's of the world, and the world is what? Passing away in the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abides how long? Forever. You read that verse. Forever. The forever is with God. And, uh, you know, the world is passing away. It's temporary. And in the end, sounds like the last Beatles album. In the end, there's a river. There's God. And there's the people of God, Revelation 22. We read a few of those verses. Go back and read that frequently. Remind yourselves. In the end, there's God. And we won't have the name of the Antichrist on our forehead. We'll have the name of God stamped on our forehead. 
What a wonderful thing. Yes, amen. Uh, there's a river, there's God, there's a people of God. I'll remind you, there's only three things that are eternal. Did you know that God's eternal? I hope you know that. You all got to realize it, though. God is eternal. Did you know that God's word is eternal? His word endures forever. We're told that in several places in the scripture, including Isaiah 40. God's word is forever. Did you know that people are forever, too? Either in heaven or in hell, but they're forever. So uh, those, are, those are the only things that are forever. Your bank account's not forever. Your stock market uh, savings are not forever. Um, your car is not forever. And they rust out real good near Chicago because they use a lot of salt on the roads. Uh, you know, our houses aren't forever. We're in an old house that's as old as I am, just about. And uh, how many things did we have to fix this year, Dolores? It really cut into, it really cut into our savings and everything else, you know, but uh, we probably put ten or $12,000 in the, this old house. Uh, had to hire a lot of it out, too, so, and we did what we co could on our own. But uh, anyway, the house is rotting away, you know. But he that does the will of the Lord abides forever. And uh, we want to keep that in mind. Okay, I think I've said enough. But uh, the application is there. If you've not trusted Christ as your Savior, call upon Him. Lord, come into my life and be my Savior. If you do know that you know Him, um, what manner of people ought we to be? Knowing that everything around us is temporary except the people sitting next to us and, and our God and God's Word. Uh, let's invest in that kind of stuff and, and go at it full force. You might be an ordinary person. Maybe you have no skills. If you have skills, God can use you too, but he has to work a little harder. But if you have no skills or no abilities, just the greatest ability of all, and I say this in that new, newest newsletter that Dolores is passing out, if you want to get one from her before you leave. The greatest ability of all is availability. If you say, let me be that person, God, I want to make myself totally, wholly, 100% available to you, God can use you. He can, and he does. And so, uh, I challenge you to do that in this present age. Be on God's side. Be 100% on God's side. And uh, I know your preacher should be, but uh, the rest of us should be too. And uh, get on the winning side. Get on the winning team. And watch what God can do. In Delavan and in the surrounding community. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, it sounded healthy this time. Okay, let's pray. You got a song uh, after this? or what yes. are we? Yeah, okay. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this day. It's a day the Lord has made. Lord, we know we're not responsible for yesterday. Yesterday's gone. We can't repeat it. We know that uh, we can't predict what's going to happen tomorrow. But we know, we know, no, know. know that, that you woke us up this morning, you brought us here, you've given us today. It's a day the Lord has made. We rejoice, we're glad in it. Use us greatly today, Lord, to speak your praises, to, to act out your praises, Lord, to, to help one another, to minister to the people around us, to a lost and a dying nation, Lord, that is willfully ignorant of your great works. Help us to realize that our God is a great fort tower. And the person who saves is the person of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. And it's in his name we ask you to get, empower us, give us strength. Lord, give us peace in our hearts. Help us to love you more each day. In the name of Christ, the Son of God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Alpha and Omega, Jesus, our Savior. Amen.